came and broke them down You broke them down There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Darkness shaking, all the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name, and my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me And what a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out We're alive, it's your life And what a love Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive And why the love we found, death can't hold us down We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive Your love is greater, your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater, your love is stronger
Welcome to Community Christian Church Online. I'm Ryan Arnold. I'm the student minister here at CCC, and I am so glad that you've logged on today. This weekend was a very special weekend around CCC. In our in-person services, we had the opportunity to honor a group of students, a group of seniors who are graduating this year. We brought them up on stage and we got to know them and have some fun with them. I can honestly say that I have loved getting to know each of these students during their time here at CCC. And we know this year hasn't gone like many seniors hoped it would. Who would have thought that a majority of their senior year would have been virtual, but they still showed up. In the midst of a difficult time, they lean closer to Jesus and closer to one another. It has been great to watch them take steps to follow Jesus and own their own faith, which is our goal for every student that calls CCC home, really for any student who lives in the White Marsh area. But just because they're graduating, just because their time in the student ministry here is done, doesn't mean they have it all figured out. In fact, there'll be a lot in store in this next phase of life. My hope, my prayer for them, as they continue to pursue a relationship with Jesus, that every day they put him first. In the big decisions that are coming up, decisions that may shape the rest of their life, but also in the small everyday decisions, that in everything they do, they put Jesus first. Check out the way this incredible verse from the Bible puts it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That is my hope for this graduating class. My hope for all of us, really. But there's something we can do for them. We can pray for them because transitions are important and sometimes they can be a bit overwhelming or even scary. Maybe you know one of these graduating seniors. Maybe you've served with them or you know their family. We would like for everyone who's tuned in today to commit to praying for one of these students for the next year. And as a church, as their church, we wanna support them in any way we can. We want them to know that wherever they go, that they will always have a church, a home here at CCC. So here's all you need to do. In the comments section of your digital CCC card, just put the name of one of these seniors that you commit to praying for. Then throughout the year, we'll update you with some ways you can be praying for them. But I'm gonna pray for them right now, and then we're gonna continue our service together. God, we pray for guidance and direction for these graduates. Help them to recognize your leading in their lives. Make their path straight and clear, and help them to not lean on their own understanding, but in every way, acknowledge you, knowing that you have their best in mind. And it's in your name that we pray, Amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion. You are my hiding place I believe you are The way The truth The life I believe you are The way The truth The life I believe through every Every promise, every breath I take, I believe that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love, I believe you are the way, the truth.
to new horizon And I'm set on you And you need me here today With mercies that are new Oh yeah, all my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long When I believe you are The way, the truth Fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay alone when I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in today and congratulations to all our high school graduates. Way to go. It's no small thing, especially in a year like we've just experienced, to complete this task, graduate from high school. That's a very good thing and something worth celebrating. Now I want to tell you something now that you're graduated that I hope sticks with you like nothing else. I hope it stays with you forever. I hope it stays with everybody, really. I remember what my mom told me the day after I graduated from high school. Never forget it. She woke me up early in the morning before she rolled off to work, and she said, David, now that you've graduated, it's time to get a job. That's what she said. Go get a job. And she was talking about a summer job. I was headed for college that fall, and during my high school years, I was involved in a lot. I played sports for my high school. I was in the band for my high school. I was involved with a lot of clubs and activities. I was involved in the student ministry at my church. And because of all that, my parents said, hey, when you're in high school, since you're involved in those things, you don't have to get a job. But the day after graduation, all that was over. No more clubs, no more high school sports, no more high school band, aged out of the youth group, time to get a job. So that's what I did. I actually had a job by noon of that day. Worked at Acme Sports, no kidding. The roadrunner was looking for a new baseball glove, He'd have felt right at home at Acme Sports. You know, they're giving away signing bonuses at some places for high school and college age kids to start working for certain places. I, I heard that and I thought, that's crazy and awesome and crazy, but still awesome. Anyway, that's the first thing my mom told me after I graduated high school. Go get a job. I want to tell you something now that you've graduated and I hope you never forget it, that it always sticks with you. And it's not get a job. I mean, some of you will do just that. Some of you will start school. Some of you will do both. Now, what I want to hold up before you today is summed up for us beautifully in the Bible, in the book of Titus. If you have a Bible with you in one way, shape, or form, get to the tiny little book called Titus. And we, we looked at a handful of verses out of Titus during last week's service, and we're going to look at one of the greatest statements out of not just Titus, but the entire Bible. It's a statement that I hope you carry with you always, and it's a foundational statement from which springs what we're even doing here, this whole church thing, this whole Christian thing. There are only three chapters in this short little letter the Apostle Paul penned, and he was writing to Titus, who was ministering on the island of Crete at the time. And Crete, an island south of Greece, was made up of many towns, and in many of these towns were many new churches that Paul and Titus had helped to establish and get going. And Paul's writing to offer guidance to Titus about how Titus is to lead and instruct and encourage these churches, because 
these churches were vulnerable to all kinds of things that could take them off course and derail what they were called to. In fact, in chapter 2, uh, the very first verse there, Paul says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. You must teach sound doctrine, Titus. And there's a reason for that. You see, if sound doctrine, sound thinking, sound theology is not taught, well, people will gravitate toward and grab onto unsound doctrine and unsound thinking and unsound theology. If people are not taught to believe the right things, they'll believe bizarre things. And that's precisely what was happening on the island of Crete. In Titus 1.14, he says, pay no attention to Jewish myths. Apparently, there were just wild stories, myths floating around, and people were gravitating towards them. And then in the third chapter of Titus, verse 9, we get another glimpse of it there. He writes, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels. Again, there were just kind of bizarre lists of genealogies and stories kind of making the rounds. Because again, if people are not regularly receiving teaching on sound doctrine, they'll latch on to unsound doctrine. Paul says they'll embrace bizarre ideas. And it's no different in our day, CCC. It's predictable. If people don't believe the right things, if our thinking isn't in line with sound doctrine, well, people will buy into bizarre things and way off thinking. So at the beginning of chapter 3, Paul starts by saying, Remind the people, remind them, Titus, of this sound doctrine. Now, there's a whole field of study that has to do with what psychologists call habituation. Habituation is the tendency of an organism to stop noticing or responding to something that's part of its environment for an extended period of time. It just doesn't notice it after a while. For instance, when you start wearing a watch, the first day you ever wear a watch on your wrist, you notice it all day long. But eventually, if you keep wearing it, unless you look at it, you're not even aware it's there. You habituate to wearing a watch. Or you can think of it this way. You move into a new house or an apartment. And the first day you move in, you have a list of things you want to fix or paint or change because you think, I couldn't stand to live with those things. And now some of you have been living in your home for years and you still have that same list. That list hasn't changed. You've just habituated. You got used to it. There's a very powerful force, habituation. But it doesn't just happen with what you wear or where you live. It can be one of the great challenges of the spiritual life, of a life of faith. It happens like this. You hear one day about the incredible opportunity of life with God, about the miracle of grace, about getting your sins forgiven, that you could be part of his family, you could be a part of God's church, that you've been given a gift by the Holy Spirit. And you come to grips with this and you wrestle with this and you decide about this. You step over a line of faith. And it's right at the forefront of your mind, all of this, and you keep going back to it. You remember that and you get all choked up almost every time it comes to your mind. But over time, what can happen is you stop being overwhelmed. You just get used to the idea that your sins are forgiven. You don't even really notice that God is present with you all the time. You grow accustomed to the fact that we have the Bible, God's word. You get used to the church. You get used to worship. You get used to communion. You just grow accustomed to it all. And what once moved you, it becomes like the watch on your wrist. It's still there, but for large chunks of time, you don't even notice it. And there's an added danger here. I mean, not only is it possible for Christians to get used to the grace of God and the love of God and the salvation that comes from God, but I can get used to the presence of sin in my life. I mean, you watch when people first begin making their way back to God, when they first become Christians, and something inside of them says, you know, there's some things about me in this house that have got to change. I mean, there's some repair work that needs to get done. There's some habits that got to go. And at an early stage of faith, we don't even know what all those changes are that we need. We just know that whatever we need to do to make our souls a fit home for the one who died for us, then that's what we got to do. We have a list. And some of us still have that same list. 
And over time, relative to sin and spiritual mediocrity, well, you just learn to live with it. You get used to it and you hardly notice. And so Paul says at the beginning of this chapter in this little letter, Titus, hey, remind the people, tell the people to remember. Now, in the first two verses there, he reminds Titus to tell the people about some basic obedience. But in verses three and following, he reminds them of what is essentially the gospel message, the gospel message. Now, for those of you who haven't been around church very long, the word gospel simply means good news. Do you know that the church has got some good news? In a world full of bad news, in a world full of tough news, in a world full of disappointing news, in a world full of fake news, in a world full of dividing news, the church booms gloriously and lovingly very, very good news. And it's really important that we consistently and continually circle back to and are clear on this glorious gospel, the good news the church has to steward, because so much is at stake. In Titus 3, verses 3 through 7, it's generally regarded by biblical scholars as perhaps the most succinct statement in the New Testament Testament about the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is what I want to give us all, old and young, doesn't matter, but especially on this day to you graduates, Titus 3, 3 through 7. Let me remind us of the glorious good news. Verse 3 says this, the Apostle Paul says to Titus, remind them of this, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Now, this first part here is about my great need. I mean, you could even write down the word need somewhere. Uh, this is sometimes called the doctrine of sin. And Paul does a wonderful thing here. He makes a shift in grammar. In the first two verses there, he says to Titus, remind the people to be obedient. And we'd expect him in verse three to say, because at one time they were foolish, but he doesn't do that. He makes this little shift. He puts it in the first person plural. We were foolish. We were disobedient. Paul says to Titus, not just the people of Crete, that's you and me, Titus. And you know what? That's you and me too, CCC. I don't know about you, but one of my biggest problems, I think partly because I grew up in the church, was for a long time I didn't understand what it is that I'm capable of apart from God. I mean, you look at verse 3 there and the description that's there, apart from the grace and power of God, I'm here to tell you that would be my life. And a key word there in that verse is the word enslaved. You know, Paul talks about this elsewhere in the Bible. He says, I do the very things I don't want to do apart from the power of the grace of God in my life. No matter how bad I want to be good, I find myself doing the very things I don't want to do. It's like I'm trapped. I'm enslaved. You ever find yourself doing things you don't want to do? In 12-step programs, the first step is, hey, I'm not powerful enough to control my own thoughts or feelings or actions on my own. In some areas of my life, I'm out of control. I think of John Foreman's song, I made a mess of me. I am my own affliction, he writes. I am my own disease. There ain't no drug that they could sell. There ain't no drug to make me well. The sickness is myself. I made a mess of me. Now let's think about out of controlness for a moment. I mean, maybe it's eating, maybe it's anger, maybe it's fear, maybe it's spending, maybe it's manipulation or pride or envy or pace of life or guilt or fear or destructive words or destructive habit, whatever it is. How many of you would say there's at least one area in my life, at least one, where I can't perfectly direct all my thoughts and feelings and behaviors. I'm out of control with, and then you fill in the blank, whatever it is. Well, it's, the truth is it's all of us in some area or another. Every one of us is out of control somewhere. And apart from the power of God, we would be fully. Imagine for a moment if the restraining power of God was gone from your life. 
I mean, no whispers of the Holy Spirit to make your conscience tender. No Bible to give you support and guide you. No church to encourage and spur you along. Imagine the worst, darkest, most destructive tendencies that you are capable of given unhindered sway over your life until they become habits a thousand times stronger than they are right now, just unchecked by any power with no regret and no remorse. That would be me. And that would be you. So listen, instead of taking it for granted, you think about where you'd be if God left you on your own, what sin would do to your life. But God did not leave you on your own. And here's the heart of the good news right here. Because in verse 3, Paul gives this beautiful phrase. Check it out. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. And in this phrase here, Paul goes from our need for a remedy, our need to be saved, our great dilemma, the doctrine of sin, he goes from that to the source of our salvation. This is sometimes called the doctrine of justification. He saved us. That's the key phrase there. He, he saved us not because of our righteousness, but because of his mercy, which is Jesus Christ on the cross. And this is what makes the Christian faith unique from all other religions, all other faiths of the world. It's fascinating how similar every world religion is. You've probably heard that before, that basically all religions are the same. They're all heading in the same direction, going to the same place. And fundamentally, that premise is true. All world religions are built on the same singular premise, except for Jesus, except for Christianity. The gospel is unique. See, all the religions say, hey, you get to God, you get to a relationship with God, a connection to God. He's up here, you're down here, and if you're going to have a relationship with God, you need to climb the ladder to make your way to Him. So, you got to be good enough, or you got to be smart enough, or you got to do the right technique, the right practice, you got to meditate and empty yourself, or you got to suffer enough, or you got to pray and fast at the right time in the right way, and then maybe you'll find favor in God's eyes somehow. But it's up to you to make your way to God. Or here in our country especially, we say, hey, be a moral individual. Do some good stuff. Steer clear of the bad stuff, the real biggies, you know? And eventually, you'll be face to face with God. And if the good stuff outweighs the bad stuff, well, you'll be good. But it's still about your morality, your charity, your goodness, your energy, your work, your effort, your self-righteousness. And the problem is, well, you can't. You can't be good enough. You can't climb the, the ladder high enough. You can't be righteous enough. You can't be clever enough. You can't be disciplined enough. We all fall short, the Bible says. We all fall short of the glory of God. We make a mess of ourselves. I make a mess of me. You make a mess of you. It's a problem. We're made in the image of God, by God, for God, created in such a way that we'll only find peace in God, trying to make our way to God. And we just don't get there. We can't get there in our own strength, trying to climb our way to God. We all find we fall short of the glory of God. But then comes verse four. Thank God for verse four, the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, and He saved us not because of us, but because of Him. Jesus, He comes to us. You don't make your way to God. God makes His way to you. Jesus, you see, lived the life that we should have lived, and He died the death that we deserve to die, and He bridged a gap so we could make our way back to God. And it's all a gift. It's all a gift. And I don't know, maybe everything you've ever had in your life, you've had to earn the hard way. I mean, maybe pretty much everything you got is the result of sweat and toil and your strength and your ingenuity. But not this. Not this CCC. Now, this is a gift, you see. So imagine for a moment if this weren't so. Imagine where you'd be if God was not a merciful God, but He was a hard God. 
Imagine if your destiny hinged on you getting it all right, on your righteousness. Imagine the anxiety and fear of never knowing whether or not you were good enough to make the cut. Imagine knowing that no matter how hard you try, you could never please God, ever. You'd never be adequate. You'd never be acceptable in His eyes. That's where we'd be. Except Paul says, when the kindness and the love of God has appeared, He saved us, not because of our acts of righteousness, but because of His mercy. So, Community Christian Church, today I remind you, every time you hear the word mercy, Every time you say the word grace, every time you sense God kind of smile on your life, every time you hold a piece of bread that Jesus said was his body broken for you, every time you hold the cup that Jesus says was his blood poured out for you, it's no accident. It's no coincidence. It's nothing to be taken for granted. That's your salvation. That's the good news, you see. And then in the second half of verse five, it's just as good. He writes, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is another part of the incredible saving grace of God. He goes from our need for it, the doctrine of sin, to the source of it, the doctrine of justification, and now the ongoing result of it. This is what's called the doctrine of regeneration. And this is the idea of being made alive to Regenerate something is to bring it to life. Renewal of the very presence and power and Holy Spirit of God. You are brought to life. From spiritual death, you have been brought to life. That's something to remember ever so often. Hey, I used to be dead in my sins, but now, thank God, I'm alive. And only God can do this. Only God can bring spiritual life from spiritual death. Only God can regenerate souls that are sick from sin. That's why baptism, it is such a big, big deal. See, baptism is the marker moment when somebody says, I'm acknowledging my great need for God's redemptive work in my life. I'm acknowledging that I got a sin problem and the remedy is Jesus Christ, His atoning death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. And I'm being baptized into Jesus. I'm identifying with that very thing, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through baptism, through going under the water, dying to my old self, rising to a new life, focused on Him, on Jesus, with Him at the center. I know that word baptism gets thrown around a lot, and there are lots of ideas that come to our mind with baptism. Sometimes a lot of folks uh, think of their christening, their sprinkling that happened when their parents, you know, they did that to them when they were a baby. That's not really how the Bible speaks of baptism. When the Bible speaks of baptism, It ties it to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So I go down under the water and come up again to this new life, just like Jesus did. I identify with Jesus in that way. I'm baptized into Christ Jesus. I'm putting my chips in with Him. I'm saying, hey, the guy that died and came back to life, I'm with Him. You know, a few years back, I came home after a long day, a challenging day. It was sort of a stressful day. And I was a bit worn out, a little on edge, really. And I walked into my house, and I came in through the kitchen there, and there was a room full of teenage boys in my kitchen, kitchen, standing around our little island we got there, stuffing their faces full of an enormous amount of food that I'm quite certain I had purchased one way or the other. And I did not recognize any of these teenagers, didn't know any of them. And none of them at first bothered looking up from the food shoveling that was going on there until finally one of them, it's like a fuzzy faced 15 year old turned toward me and he just stuffed like an entire piece of pizza into his mouth, maybe two. And he looks at me and he says to me, Hey bro. Now I cannot stand when someone I do not know addresses me with a Hey bro or a Hey dude or something like that. I don't even like when people I know call me bro. I don't even like when my brother calls me bro and he's my bro. And I say this knowing full well that there's about a dozen or so people in our church who will call me that the next time I see them. I'm looking at you, Tom Palm. So anyway, fuzzy face pizza mouth calls me bro. And I'm going to decide that I'm going to walk right over to him and get some things straight about how to introduce yourself to someone, especially if you're in their house eating their food. 
we're going to do class 101 of man school, you know? And as I'm walking straight toward Fuzzy Face, he can tell, I'm sure because my face wasn't all that warm and hospitable. And, and all of a sudden, when I'm walking over to this guy, my oldest son, Daniel, he comes up from the basement into the kitchen. And he's like, hey, dad. And he introduces all these guys, you know, this is Dustin and Steve and George and Stinky and Fuzzy. And I don't remember their names, really. He's like, I got a FIFA video game tournament going on downstairs. That's what we're playing. And he just kind of de-escalated everything I was feeling. And I'm sure Fuzzy Face there said something like, I'm with him. I'm with Daniel. And everything was cool because they were with my son. See, if it's just a random group of teenage boys from the neighborhood who I do not know and they're invading my house, well, that's not cool and they're not staying. But because they're with my son, we're good. Make yourself at home. Try not to choke on a slice of pizza and don't burn my house down. Baptism, you understand, is when you say, I'm with him. And Jesus says to the Father, they're with me. It's okay. It's a declaration. It's a stake in the ground moment. And it's a holy moment where this great drama gets worked into our souls. And listen, some of you have never taken this step. You've never been baptized. You've never entered into this covenantal relationship with God and accepted his grace and mercy and forgiveness for your life. You've never identified with Jesus in this way. And it is time. I'm telling you, what are you waiting for? It's time. You know, some of you have said, I'm with him, but you've never taken the step of baptism. Now, some of you were christened as an infant, but you never decided for yourself and been baptized. This is your step and this is your chance. In fact, we've got a baptism celebration coming up on the first Sunday of June, June 6th. Going to be a great day here at CCC as we get to celebrate some folks taking that step of baptism. And it's totally worth celebrating, which is why we got a big old tent we're setting up on the back parking lot out there. We got a couple of tanks we're setting up, one inside, one outside. And we got several different food trucks, including the Miss Twist truck, the Dizzy Cow Pizzeria truck, Cody's Grill truck, the Dunkin' Donut truck. Did you even know there was a Dunkin' Donut truck? Well, it's coming. And then my personal favorite, the truck of deliciousness. Come on. You know you want to try something from the truck of deliciousness. And check this out. Everything's half off. That's right. We've worked a deal where everything is half off. It's a great deal, half off. Tremendous deal. But not as tremendous of a deal as what Paul's talking about here in Titus 3, 3 through 7. Paul, he actually ends this incredible section of the Bible talking about where it all one day ultimately leads. He kind of wraps it up by talking about our future hope. Remind the people, Titus, of the future hope of the glorious gospel. I mean, check it out. Second half of verse seven says, he poured out the Holy Spirit on us. God poured out the Holy Spirit on us so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And this is a trustworthy saying. Make note of that. We become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Paul says elsewhere in the Bible, in Romans 8, 17, we have become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I mean, you just think about that. Ponder it for a moment. You are an heir of God and a co-heir with Jesus Christ. You know, there are three little letters, I-P-O. Do you know what they stand for? Initial Public Offering. And the way that it works is a company gets started and it operates maybe a long time under the radar screen. But then the day comes when it goes public. It offers stock. And on that day, the day of the IPO, initial public offering, when things work out right, well, fortunes get made. Destinies get assured. People can strike it big because of IPOs. But there's a lot of risk involved because they're never a sure thing. And Paul says, Titus, remind the people, this is a trustworthy saying, one day the trumpet's going to sound and one day graves are going to open up and the dead in Christ will rise and Wall Street and the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 will experience an eternal correction on that day. 
and Microsoft will get exceedingly micro and the kingdom is gonna go public and people who have invested wisely will see the face of God and will know treasures that moth and rust cannot corrupt and thieves cannot break in and steal. This is a trustworthy saying. This is a sure thing, he says. Now imagine for a moment that you had no hope, that you had no bright future. I mean, imagine for a moment living under the reality that this world and everything in it had no more meaning than a dream, a nightmare, really. You, your family, your friends, all that you love, you're just a chance collection of atoms that have no purpose and no future. That's where we'd be without the gospel. But it is not so. For those who have chosen it, accepted it, stepped into it, been baptized into it. You have been made an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. So today I remind you, every time you experience hope, every time discouragement comes but doesn't get the upper hand on you, every time you open your eyes and decide that you will face another day, every time you experience an inner surge of resolve to keep going, it's no accident and it's no coincidence. It is no tribute even to your own perseverance It's the gift of hope that comes from God that salvation brings. This is a trustworthy saying, Paul says. Stress these things. Make sure the people remember them. Don't take it for granted. Don't forget the incredible gift of saving grace, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 3 through 7. You know, graduates, you're getting ready to go out into the world. You're being launched into the world, really. And there will be all sorts of doctrine that's thrown at you, all sorts of thinking, all sorts of beliefs. And you will probably hear or be told that the church is full of old news, outdated news. The world's passed it by or something like that. Don't you believe it? You remember again, Titus 3, 3 through 7, the glorious good news of the gospel that Jesus brings. And I hope it's the core of your identity your whole life long. So, Let's take a few moments now and let's reflect on Jesus, his saving grace, the gift of God's kindness and mercy through Jesus' atoning death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave that gives this good news. It ushers in this good news. Spend some moments thanking God for it. So let's celebrate communion now with a piece of bread and some juice symbolizing Jesus' body and blood given because of God's great love for you and me.
dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Thanks again for logging on today. If you'd like to support CCC's mission of helping people find their back to God, you can text CCC White Marsh to 77977 or just follow the link at communitycc.net. Don't forget about the baptism celebration on June 6th. There's going to be a tent and food trucks and of course baptisms. If you're interested in finding out more or have questions about baptism, just head to the website. Say hi on social media and connect all week. It would be great to hear from you. Thanks again for making CCC Online a part of your week. See you right back here next time.